We're going to do some introductions. I'll start with myself. I'm Charles Fitzgibbon. I'm filling in for Mark Aaron, who had a, a death in the family, unfortunately, so he couldn't be here. But uh, I've been with Site Selection Magazine and Conway Data now for 10 years. And uh, in those 10 years, there has only been one state that has won the Governor's Cup, which is our annual tally of corporate economic development and uh, uh, corporate expansion uh, projects. Texas has dominated, and we're going to find out why from some of these experts up here. These are the folks that do the heavy lifting, do the work with the corporates that are making decisions about locations around the globe and where to put their money and uh, grow their businesses. I started off talking about Texas being so dominant uh, as it relates to our rankings. And what we look at are just objective data points about corporate expansion. Texas had 1,028 qualifying projects last year in our site selection Governor's Cup. The next closest state was Ohio with fewer than 500. So I'd love to throw this question out to the entire group. Why is Texas so dominant for corporate expansion? Uh, well, I'll go first. Um, look, I think uh, it, when we work with companies and they're thinking about where to deploy in the U.S., th uh, they have to follow the people, first of all. Texas is a net importer of talent, as many of you know. A lot of people around the country are moving here, and, and many of them are talented. STEM skills, engineers, IT workers. Um, Texas is not only an appealing place for business, but it's an appealing place for, for talent. So that's one of the reasons why I think companies are following that talent. They want to go to a state that's growing. Texas is also a huge market. There's a lot of other businesses to do business with in Texas. Texas is centrally located in the United States. And some of Texas's operating costs are competitive. Some, not all. Uh, but of course, the, the headline that everyone knows is no state, corp no, no state personal income tax in, in Texas, which of course is, is also a draw. So I think all those things contribute. Um, and then at the local level, there are pluses and minuses with different communities that would play into the final decision. I, I agree with everything Darren said. And you know, at the end of the day, economic development, really it's about the right site, access to the right talent, the right infrastructure. But even more of that, and this really rings true in this era of hypermobility among people and companies, you know, job creators want to feel that their elected officials and the local development community is really accountable to them and views job creators really as partners in building a strong and viable economy and not an adversary. And that, that's not the case in so many states around the country today. I mean, how would you like to be living in Portland, Oregon right now, where the mayor this week told, you, told its citizens, uh, unless you're dying, don't call 911 because we're not coming to help. I mean, that, that's that sort of liv livability factor where taxpayers feel they're getting a return on their tax dollar and, and the respect from, from their elected officials. I've been fortunate enough to work in pretty much every state, Canada, Mexico, et cetera. And so, and I work with different types of companies, uh, corporations, uh, very, very large General Motors, uh, as well as much smaller companies like Imperion, which is a uh, call center company. And as they said, you know, it's really our people first, and it's gotten even more so now. You've got to do whatever you can to attract employees and retain them. It's really twofold. And so we find that extremely important. Uh, and we're easy. We're in the middle of the United States, as was said. We've got DFW Airport, one of the best communication uh, airports in the world, uh, and because we're central, it doesn't take much time to get somewhere. I've had clients tell me, well, I only want to go so many hours away from, from here. Um, and then not just the airport, but then you look at all the interstates that we have, truck driving, uh, industrial properties. Those are all impacted by those kind of things because now time is also very, very important. So, you know, um, Getting to market is, is incredible. And then the one thing I've seen, and I've been here since 74, uh, I'm old, but um, when I got into commercial real estate in 86, you know, everything was oil, banking, gas, and real estate. But I've seen such an incredible growth in all of the other areas, uh, particularly in technology, uh, which drew a lot of other people in that now the companies that want to come in or are looking to come in can take advantage of. 
So everything you see is still moving fast, and because we share a great deal with Fort Worth, it gives them a lot of opportunities to live in different places. You can pass that. Yeah, there you go. yeah I got to turn it off. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So I come with a really interesting perspective. So for 17 years before I went into site selection, I actually worked on the economic development side of the fence. So I was a Texas economic developer. And so from that standpoint, I've seen the, the, this state grow and change. And one of the things I would basically say is we learn from our mistakes. So when the oil bust happened, when the dot-com bust happened, one of the biggest things is, is we're very diverse. Our industries are incredibly diverse, which brings a lot of diverse talent to the state. So from that perspective, it also opens up the types and kinds of companies that we can recruit, which where you have in some states, it's a little more finite as to what their competitive advantages are. So they only work for specific industries. And Texas has kind of opened that door to where it's not just oil and gas, it's not just dot com, it's headquarters of all kinds, it's technology, it's you know life science now is starting to grow in the state and others. So because of that continual diversification, it's a huge thing. And I always kind of go back to, mm -hmm. I know we all hate to hear it, but the HQ2, uh, when they announce their headquarters. One of my favorite things is I think they're creative in how they sell themselves as a state. When Austin submitted their submission for HQ2, they counted every university within the state of Texas as theirs. And that's kind of the, the key point, right? You have the quality of life that attracts anybody from anywhere to come to your community and live. You have all the sports, all the, all the outdoors. You have lakes, you have mountains, you have beaches. May not be as pretty as some, but it's still here and it's still accessible. Lots of golf, lots of outdoors. You, almost four seasons, almost, <laughs> in some cases. So I think you can make a good competitive argument from that standpoint, but I think having the diversity of industry makes it a lot easier to recruit different organizations to come to the, the state, and then of course, the regulatory environment. It's a lot, it's a lot more lax in some other states within the, within the United States where it's more protected for the company to be located here than leaning on the sides of the employee. You guys should be in site location. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, you know, everybody's commented on the, just think about the impact of the DFW airport on this region. It, it's probably, we're starting, remember when you used billions and that was outlandish? But you could probably say over 50 years, that's trillions, that's driven trillions of dollars of investment into the North Texas region. Then you think about the impact that NASA had on Houston, helping diversify, and MD Anderson, of course, too, diversify Houston away from just being an oil and gas outpost, outpost, excuse me, 18 ports in the state of Texas. Now you've got, you've got this massive metroplex region, you've got the Houston region, and you've got Austin and San Antonio growing together. So you've got these massive regions of economic activity um, and, and I guess I'm getting old too because I can re remember when, you know, like 50% of the state budget was related to oil and gas. And that's just not the case. We're fully diversified. We're becoming more and more diversified every day. That, um, that's really, really a good thing. And that's one of the really the main, and gra main things and gratifying things I've seen over my years at the TDC is that we can compete for lots of different um, businesses and, and uh, investment sectors. So just one quick final point that I left out. I kept mentioning about, not kept mentioning, but I mentioned about DFW. Uh, I forgot to mention one of the biggest things, particularly from the industrial point of view, is Alliance Airport. You know, you've got, you've got a, something that I don't know anybody else has, and that's the ability not only to bring people and things in, but then you've got the industrial side over there and it's shared between Dallas and Fort Worth, and that's been a big hit. So we've heard talent and workforce, central location, um, quality of life. I didn't hear incentives. Where do incentives factor in? <laughs> well, I'm being one of the older ones here, kind of reflecting back like Carlton was doing. Um, I can remember when economic development was solely at the local level the cities, the counties, and eventually the economic development corporations. And, and working throughout the country, that was unique because most of the other states, if not almost all, 
were at the state level. Was if you went in, you went into the state, and you got your support through the state, and you you might get something at the local level, but you might not. And then what happened was the infamous Boeing project. Boeing was going to move their headquarters. I worked that project. Um, those of us that were in native Texans knew that the CEO's wife had lived, grown up in Plano, Texas. Plano, Texas does not have any mountains or oceans or, or, or the miracle mile to go shopping. So, you know, many times it's the CEO family situation that makes that final determination on the headquarters. And even though Colorado tried and we tried, it ended up in Chicago with a, a place on the lake and her getting to go shopping. But the best thing that came out of that, and um, I was a lobbyist with it, and Carlton, I know you were involved in it, and some of the rest of you may have been, was Governor Perry at that time uh, worked with us at the state level, and there was statewide lobbying from anyone in economic development uh, to, to get the Texas Enterprise Fund in place. So what is, is the result of all that is that we have that program, and since then we had other programs come about, like Chapter 313 to, to limit with the school districts, et cetera. But we've got the full package. You know, we've got uh, great statewide. I think we can improve, and we've made a lot of headway on Texas Workforce Commission with their skills development. Uh, one of the things that we need to do more of in that area, I think, is to allow companies uh, to be more involved in doing their own training and us funding some of that. We used to do that, and then there were some issues, and they quit doing it that way, and then it gets channeled a different way without getting into technicalities. But that, I think, is, is a real key, is because you've got the full package, able to support from uh, all levels, uh, whether it's helping in infrastructure or it's tax relief or it's cash grant for job creation or a rail spur or whatever. That, so. so I will, I will, I'm going to take a different tone to that. Um, I feel like Texas is successful because the localities are given a lot of power and your cities and your counties and your regions can actually come together and create incentive packages where you don't have to involve the state. The state has packages, but the timing to get them is not always business friendly. It takes a little too long for a lot of companies who need to make decisions very quickly. Um, chapter 313 sunset in December of 2022. They did replace it with a brand new bill that has come in and it sounds like it's going to be something that can be salvageable to that program, but it's yet to be proven. So I think we're going to have to see how that goes to be over there. And that's going to really impact our capability to provide incentives in the state of Texas to very large capital investment projects, because those are the ones who are going to be looking for some type of relief in that space due to our very high, it's not property taxes, it's valuation. It's not necessarily that our property taxes are high, but our valuations have been increasing year over year, which is starting to eat away at the Texas storyline. We used to always lead with no corporate income tax, no personal income tax, but property taxes have gotten pretty high. Our franchise tax is not exactly known as the best kind of tax to tax a corporation with, um, and there's no relief to offset it. So from that standpoint, it's been the locals who have created things like the type A and type B funds that can come in and provide grant funding, um, paper job grants, tax abatements on their own, and other ways to mitigate infrastructure improvements and others in the creative ways that the local communities come to the table to actually make a deal work and get a deal done that has really, in my mind, what has made Texas successful. I decided that I think the legislature deserves a lot of credit for replacing those property tax exemptions in only a year, okay, you quickly realized that the danger of unilaterally disarming yourself of very powerful incentives for the types of projects that are out there right now, land intensive projects and in industries like semiconductors, for example. Florida is now in year five without their qualified tax incentive. So the legislature deserves credit. I like the new film tax credit. I mean, there's so many industries related to film production, like software development, the gaming industry, coding. Uh, that ties into STEM uh, learning. I mean, you think about that autonomous vehicle exhibit. That's essentially content creation, okay? Um, that, that's all you have to think about film incentives in, in 2023. And lastly, to Linda's point about how economic development has gone up the food chain from the local level to the governor's office, now it's gone all the way up to the White House and in the halls of Congress. So you think about Texas's unique ability to leverage the IRA 
incentives, okay, for uh, battery component manufacturers that want to be in Monterey, okay, it's one of the largest global hubs of manufacturing today. I mean, Central Texas is uniquely positioned to really benefit from that. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Darren? Nothing on incentives? I mean, I got a lot on incentives, but they, they've said <laughs> they hate it they've, all. they've said some great things. I think it's telling that we did not list Texas incentives as a reason why companies are choosing Texas. As Kim said, um, there are programs. They're a little different in Texas, but it, it's not putting the state substantially ahead of others, right? It's 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 not it's not a differentiator. So when companies choose to locate in other states or other locations and Texas was on the short list and didn't make it, what are the reasons why? Who wants to kick that one off? I mean, every project is different. Every project has unique real estate and, and water demands. Obviously, water, the big challenge Texas has, and it's not alone in this regard. I mean, high growth markets in the Sun Belt are dealing with infrastructure, okay? Uh, the need for enough water and utilities uh, and affordability, all right? So very often those metrics come into play. Uh, this, this legislature is investing in water infrastructure with new desalination plants uh, and new water infrastructure to increase water inventory. That, that's key. And if you're looking for a bright spot with affordability, you know, so much of the, the issue with affordability is, is not Texas's problem to solve. I mean, it, you look at mortgage rates at 8%, only 3% uh, 18 months ago. Uh, and Texas is leading the nation in building starts. There are 260,000 building starts last year. That's 50,000 more than in Florida. Five times as many, five times as much as in high growth Tennessee and Arizona. So that's, that's something to, uh, to feel good about there. So headquarters are my specialty. I've already located 14 headquarters in my career. And one of the biggest key things that has been impacting decisions right now is some of the legislative decisions around LGBTQ, abortion, and other challenging legal decisions of how they want to, to go in a cultural environment. And that doesn't always align with the culture of the companies that are coming here, especially if they're coming from the Northeast, if they're coming from the West Coast. Um, and Today is a battle for talent. We've, I think we've addressed that. And if you're alienating anyone of any group or kind or type, it's harder for me as an employer to find workers that want to move to a community, that want to have that. And it's not that companies want to get involved in your politics. That's not really what they want. What they want is to make sure that they can hire anybody and everybody that they need to to come here from anywhere globally and be able to feel comfortable in a community. And the companies that I have been working with lately that have eliminated taxes have done that on the, that basis. Um, a lot of the corporations that I represent, uh, not necessarily looking at headquarters, although I also do those, uh, but almost every one of them, we start off usually with at least five states that we're competing against. And uh, we narrow it down to the local levels based on a lot of different uh, items um, and all the different things we've talked about, not just the sites, the buildings, if they're existing or if they'd have to build. But what I've seen is um, every state, I'm just going to use Phoenix, Atlanta, and Nashville, and Dallas. So often, that it, it, when what I've seen recently, it comes down to those four. And they've all gotten very sophisticated with their economic development groups, the brokers that are working there, uh, things that weren't really there even 15 years ago. And so I think, you know, you've got competition, and so that's why we have to keep, you know, being competitive for here. Um, we did the um, LEGO's first U.S. manufacturing facility. Uh, it kind of falls in that category of calling a mega project because through all the phases, it's a billion dollar project. Uh, about 700 acres, part of that going to be uh, solar farm, which is something new that, that we're seeing more and more. Even if they can't get enough milliwatt out of the acreage they have, they want to be perceived as green and so buying off the grid. That project considered, uh, we actually started working on it in 2016 because there were various starts and stops. Um, the Texas area, specifically Dallas-Fort Worth, down Interstate 35 South, almost to Austin, were all areas that were considered. Um, we ended up putting it in uh, Richmond, Chesterfield County, um, and a couple of key reasons there. 
Um, first of all, um, ex extreme infrastructure. There was nothing available at the time that had the infrastructure in place. Texas is a little behind in that area in terms of, um, you know, when you're needing something that may be 60 megawatts or more of electric power or you have a high water use or whatever. And plus, when we get further south, we get down into some of the aquifers and things, which can be a problem. And But one of the strong points about Virginia was they have an exceptional workforce training program. And it's very geared uh, to plastic extrusion, and automation, uh, ro robotics, et cetera. And it's, it's a, a program that I wish we had in Texas. And that's why I want to say something in workforce that I would like to see us more, to the point where they're going to take a piece of their equipment and put it into their satellite locations and people can train, you know, as part of the community college and trade school environment on actually, you know, Lego equipment um, because they're going to need, it's like over 2,300 jobs that will be created in, in that project. So that's one of the things that happens when I say I, I, I feel strongly and I know that Kim does too on, on the workforce side and that we, we do have, you know, we've made, made a lot of progress, but we need to really uh, look at funding more in terms of um, with uh, trade schools, the, the universities, the community colleges, and not on, so much on the R&D side, it's just the straight application of uh, being able to work in the, in the new age of technicians that are needed. Charlie, the question of why Texas loses uh, in your Governor's Cup database, you cited that it had, in the last year, 1,300 wins. The next highest state was something like 500 or 600 wins. But I would tell you, Texas shows up in most searches. I would, I would put to you that Texas loses more than Texas wins. You lose more than, well more than half the deals, and they end up going somewhere else. But most of our clients, if not every one of them that's at least considering something in the central U.S., Absolutely, they're going to throw Texas into the mix. So, so why why are you losing more than half of these deals, or sixty, or seventy, or eighty percent of these deals? A number of reasons. One, sometimes you're getting out hustled. Sometimes the state economic development group at these other states, as John indicated, and as Van indicated, you know, they're they're very sophisticated, and and in Texas, it's kind of a not very well funded state economic development group, we kind of leave it to the locals. Other states match up really well with that. And so Texas is sometimes getting outgunned. You're getting outgunned in incentives, for sure. I won't plow that field again. Uh, you, you sometimes have clients that are worried about electrical outages and grid stability, or worried about long-term water scarcity of not just Texas, but Arizona and New Mexico, and sometimes that scares them off. Uh, sometimes Texas is not the lowest cost freight solution. If all the customers are on the eastern seaboard, you've got a freight penalty to be here. So there's a lot of reasons why Texas is not going to win every deal that it sees. Um, but I think the message here is some of those factors that we've listed off are controllable. You can do something about them. Here's another one. There aren't enough good sites in Texas. You don't have great certified sites that are ready to go, that are pad ready. Those sites all have factories on them. They're gone. So what we're like left picking through are a bunch of the leftovers that other companies have seen and rejected, seen and rejected, and now we're seeing it for the seventh time for another project because the state can't and the locals can't keep up with the demand for these sites. And so some of these factors are controllable. You can do something about them. And I think the enemy, the enemy of success is complacency. Yes, Texas is awesome. I mean, the, this whole thing is why Texas, right? But we can't get complacent if, if we are looking at this from a, from a perspective of how can we attract more. Because you will get out hustled. You will get out dealt in the incentive side. And sometimes Texas will be the high cost state. You, you nailed it, Darren. And, uh, and I, I agree with all of y'all uh, in your perspectives. Um, you know, a couple of things. Um, it's interesting. Other states generally use more of a top-down approach. You know, the call goes into the state capital. You need uh, this kind of site. You know, if that's in Georgia, uh, you know, they'll, they'll give you the three cities where those sites are, right? Well, over the years, 
just because of the advent of the economic development sales tax and these mega regions that that work with the sales tax corporations, consultants like like my friends sitting here, they know if they need to be in North Texas, they know either the the suburb that they're going to go directly to, or they're starting with the Greater Dallas Chamber or the Fort Worth Chamber or you know any other larger organizations. Frisco is now on the map with everybody. So we're you know, where we may not be as strong at the state level. And by the way, we think it's the best time, the relationship between the locals and the state, because Adriana Cruz was one of the local people at one time. So she understands the issues at the local level. Now with Aaron heading up the, the, the state marketing effort, uh, we we think this is, we're, you know, we're at a, a really, really great harmonious time uh, in our history of the relationship between the state and the local level. Darren's right, uh, other states can out hustle us. They, they focus in on the incentives, whereas we have to do them at the local level. And I'll say this, you know, in the last five years or so, politics has begun to creep into our economic development activities in the state at the state level and at the local level you know if if the politicians would simply leave things alone the way they are we're going to be fine uh and by the way one of the reasons i know this uh just anecdotally the number one visited page on the tdc website is the job opportunities page if you're an economic developer in the country you're going to, if you come to Texas, you're going to get to work projects on your own or with your community, likely, and you're going to be well compensated, and you're going to get, a, you, hopefully, you're going to get the kind of freedoms to run the projects that you might not see in other states. That's not to say other states don't do it well. They, the, you know, I worked in site location back, you know, when we were doing it on Big Chief tablets and stuff. Uh, that was supposed to be funny, but anyway, uh, back in those days, you, you know, one, one of the things as a Texan I learned was just the amazing people that work in, I worked in 35 states, and that work in economic development, how good they are, and in those days was around the time we passed the economic development sales tax here, the people that were working in economic development in the rest of the country were decidedly better than the people that were working in economic development here. We're talking late 80s, early 90s. That's changed a lot. We have about a billion two at the local level going into economic development across 725 economic development corporations. I mean, the smallest economic development corporation in the state has 27 people in the town. The largest, Corpus Christi, has 400,000. So, you, you know, we've got big cities, little cities, and all in between that have or, or, or are able to bring local resources to bear, um, you know, to bring projects in, uh, into their communities. I would add sometimes our size is also, like, you know, we're talking about all these programs and a lot of the states that we're mentioning is best practices are a lot smaller than Texas. We were literally just talking about this yesterday about how long it takes to drive from Dallas to Brownsville. Like, you need a day and a half. Um, so from that standpoint, I think sometimes our size gets the best of us. Um, I think sometimes a little bit of perception gets the best of us. Everybody sees Texas and wide open plains, lots of farmland, lots of ranches, but they forget the part that the infrastructure has to be there. You can't just walk out by a ranch and it's going to be like ready to go uh, as a mega site. And you know, in the, min the middle of that. So sometimes it's a little bit of, the, of just the overwhelming size of Texas that causes a lot of consternation for our clients. Um, you know, we did a project in just the sprawl here in DFW was so confusing to them because they were like, am I supposed to be in downtown? Am I supposed to be in Plano? Am I supposed to be in Frisco? Am I supposed to be in Fort Worth? I don't, I don't really understand. And sometimes that can be a little, you know, like everything lines up from a data perspective, but if they can't get that comfort feel or really understand where they're supposed to be within the community to really fit. Um, so I think we have to work on that a little bit of our storylines and how, having people feel comfortable with our size. We from Texas are used to being big. Everything's bigger in Texas. It doesn't bother us. We drive everywhere. 
some people are used to trains and plane, you know, all those kinds of things. And so it's a, just a different culture from that standpoint. And having people to come and ease them into that and understand where they can find a way to fit in with us is sometimes something that I think we could work a little harder on um, in that standpoint. Because we're, we're, we're hospitable, we're very friendly, we're known as one of the friendliest states in the union, but sometimes it's just we're so big. Like I sit here and laugh because I was watching the, the, the titles for here and it was like, you know, why North Texas? Why Houston? Oh, and South Texas. And why, you know, like, so we're so big, it's hard to cover that much ground in such a short period of time. And we have such unique communities to boot that a pro something that looks at Houston doesn't look at San Antonio, doesn't look at Austin, doesn't look at Dallas. There's very unique communities that we represent here within the state. So having each of those communities learn how to tell their story super strong about what makes them different and embracing that difference that we all don't have to be Austin, we all don't have to be Dallas, we all don't have to be Houston. We have all these unique ways to share what we are, rural, small, medium, whatever it is. We all have something special here in the state of Texas, but sometimes it's just too much for someone to experience in a very short period of time. And our projects are moving fast we barely get 24 hours in a city before we're moving on to the next one. So, you know, having that better embrace, understanding how to work with the, the clients that we're working with to make them feel more comfortable and understand your community. And like, you know, you look at Dallas-Fort Worth and almost 8 million people now and you're like, where am I supposed to live? This is too much, it's too much. And, you know, so you've got to help kind of make them feel a little less overwhelmed with the sheer size of our state. Thank you for that. Yes. Can I say? Um, I want to touch on a couple of things that um, I've mentioned and others have too. Back on the um, infrastructure and the site issue. Uh, you read in the paper a lot on these large, like I mentioned, the uh, Lego project. Um, I'm working on five electric arc furnace projects. Uh, one of them is going into Texas, working on the siting on the second one. Eventually there will be a total of five throughout the U.S. One of the, the issues that we're running into is um, you know there's just competition on these sites. You read a lot about the uh, the EV activity, whether it's the cars or it's the batteries, and all of these are large power users and in some cases large water users. And um, as as Darren was saying, you know that um, we just have sites. You know we've got land, but the infrastructure is not there, and you can't wait for it to get in place. I found that the um, utility companies outside of Texas are more apt to step up and uh, help with um, a substation or extension of something, or upgrading whatever is needed, or the railroads to throw in a rail spur. And you have some of them that actually um, will, you know, have grant programs that they'll do in economic development. We don't do anything about that. Like I say, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when the utility companies did, that if I had a project and they needed a substation, then they would work out something to where they either paid for all or a portion of it. That doesn't happen anymore in Texas. Uh, it, the money has to come from the local level, or like with my client, you know, the clients had to step up and plan that they're gonna have to put in another substation. So, uh, and the other thing that happens, and I think in why some, uh, we lose some, uh, and I think this applies everywhere, is that on these big projects that are putting in millions and millions and sometimes billions of dollars, they, they also have, you know, um, one of the steel mills is 300 jobs, but which you know, was, used to be a, a big number. Now, like I say, you're talking some that may be 5,000 jobs, and they can't be near each other. You know, um, and not just company, industry, industry, but anyone going after that kind of workforce demand, because that's another area where we, like I said, not just Texas, but that we're behind in uh, getting that workforce training done and cultivating. We've got a humongous gap in uh, semiconductor uh, jobs. We're going to have thousands and thousands of unfilled jobs that we're gonna have to bring them in from outside the US because you just can't get them educated in time to fill some of those positions. And um, one last thing I'm going to leave you with, and I had some stats I was gonna share with you, is cybersecurity. That's one of the fastest growing industries. It's gonna double 
by 2026. And, and when you talk about all that we're talking about doing with AI and um, any of the semiconductor activity and whatnot, and with the way we live now in our, our hybrid environment and everything's mobile and, and everything, there's so many chances for you to get hacked. I got hacked twice this week on two different credit cards <laughs> that I used at the gas station. And, and so, I mean, and I'm very careful about that kind of thing. So it's, it's just gotten uh, where, so there's a job opportunity there to study in, in cybersecurity. And that's also the, if you talk to people like all of us and, and interview folks through the magazines have done it and the Guild has done it in different ones, probably the biggest threat to business is cybersecurity. And we know it is the government because the city of Dallas has recently had issues. And so no one's exempt from it. You know, it happens to people like me, but it also happens to cities like Dallas. So think and, cybersecurity. And certainly casinos. We yeah. all saw what happened in <laughs> Vegas. In Vegas. Yikes. <laughs> Folks, we got about one minute left on the schedule. I want to make sure I give people in the audience a chance to ask any questions. We've got a pretty unique and diversified group up here of site selection experts. Any questions for these folks? So, um, in, in your, uh, from your perspective, if there was one thing that we could do better in the state of Texas that would make us more competitive, what would that one thing be? I would say less restrictive land use policies. Austin's been a leader on this. More density is the answer. To, affordability is key, okay? With respect to people need to be able to afford to live in, in Texas. Number two is promote your, your strengths. Obviously, we mentioned the unique linkages to the global marketplace. Uh, DFW, okay, now 50th anniversary. New Terminal F coming on stream in 2026. Uh, and robotics is key here. I, I'll just give you a quick, uh, not to talk in theory, but in, in real life. We just did the UPS project in shirts at the Enterprise Industrial Park. And robotics was a major, major reason they chose that location along the high growth SH-130 corridor. That's a real training asset that really should be aggressively promoted, okay, because all segments of our economy today rely upon robotics. So I'm gonna go with workforce development. That is the big thing that we could do a lot better. Um, I am a product of public schools in Texas. I am a product of public Texas universities. So I know that we've got it in us, but we just have not been creative enough to battle what is happening in other states and other communities and in other countries and how they are educating their folks to come in. And it's, it's a pipeline, it's sustainable is what we're looking for. We want good K through 12 um, education with a pipeline that feeds into community colleges or technical schools that feeds into a four year university. It has to have that capability to do that. No, you know, we have to be better at that. Um, you know, some of the legislation that's in place that binds that we can only train for jobs that exist in the community as it stands today is so limiting because jobs are changing so fast that you, they have to be able to upskill with the companies that are there because you're actually even putting retention at risk because you're not keeping up with the new things that are coming like robotics and AI and cybersecurity and others. So being able to open up our workforce development training funds and dollars to support new incoming talents and skills, giving some flexibility to turn curriculum around really quickly. It's, there's been a lot of improvement. I, I'm really excited. Um, again, I, I did economic development in some of our larger community colleges were not easy to work with. They were very siloed, they were very hard to get into, they were very hard to get training programs put in place. And we're seeing some of the largest city community colleges come up and realize this is a huge thing and they need to be a participant of it. And I know some of them are here today, which is even better, um, is to see them starting to participate in that. But now we've got to take away that restriction that we can't create new training programs for incoming emerging technologies and emerging skills. These steel mills I'm talking about, they're automated and robotics. So it's not your, your steel mill dirty like you used to have. It's people that are highly educated to be able to operate it. So that's just an example of you know needing the technicians. It's getting it down to that level. It's not somebody working in a computer developing AI and then spending on that. This is somebody that's making rebar that's gonna go in a, a highway. I'll make this very quick from a broker's perspective. Um, one of the things I'm working on a lot now are data centers. That has been a huge push for data center uh, buildings. And the one problem that I think has been mentioned 
uh, but not necessarily focused on is that we do not have enough sites ready to go immediately that has the power or surprisingly you may not think about it or the water for the cooling that those have to have so it, we're constantly running up against we've got a low supply but a big demand and if we can't do it and we can't do it quickly and it's not ready they're not going to wait 12 or 18 months to get it out there they're going to go to someplace else I agree with Van. Certified sites, more of them and larger. And then the second one is eliminate complacency at the local level. Your competitors are really, really strong. You can't be complacent. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the way our system, the way it's been organized over the last 30, 35 years has worked for us. And it's worked very well. But uh, politics have entered into economic development at both the state and local level to an extent that, that you know, are troubling. They're, they're very troubling. To Darren's uh, point, I mean, I think there is a lot of anti-growth sentiment at the, at the local level because we're spoiled. We're spoiled. We've had relentless economic growth for literally decades, other than the 80s um, uh, banking and, and oil and gas bust, dot com, some, the 08, 09 recession went away. Here we lost 450,000 jobs, but we got them back within a couple of years. So we've got to educate our elected officials about how important this is. I would argue that the complacency has allowed other states to win projects that we used to win. I mean, Tulsa's getting stuff that used to be ours. Kansas City with Panasonic. Arkansas with I don't know how many battery plants. Okay, I, I didn't want to go here, but I'm, I'm here now. Okay, so <laughs> we, we shouldn't lose to Arkansas in anything. <laughs> Tiddlywinks, sorry, Mr. Jones, I know you're from there, uh, and we're not gonna lose tomorrow either, okay? Uh, but but I, I'm, I'm saying we're, you know, people are coming after us, and they're coming after us hard. Just like states came after, like we came after California. People need to understand that, and, 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 and either, do, either understand that and get out of politics and let our, let our communities succeed and fail. If they want to fail, well, that's on them. Uh, but get out of the local um, economic development because that's where our resources are. Great. Thank you, Carlton. Is there any state it's okay to lose to? I can't think of one. <laughs> All right, folks. We're about uh, 12 minutes over schedule here, so we need to wrap it up. Let's thank our panelists. And we got about a half hour left for Why Texas, the second edition. So let's go out there and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.